All right, I think I'll start at least the uh, the introduction. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jeff Hulstrung, president of the Green Mountain Audubon Society, or chapter of the National Audubon Society serving uh, Franklin, Grand Isle, and Chittenden counties in Vermont. If you receive the Audubon magazine and live in one of those counties, you're most likely a member of Green Mountain Audubon, so thank you very much. If you're interested in joining, I pasted a link to our website in the chat, which allows you to get inform more information and if you're interested to join the chapter. Our chapter is based in Northwestern Vermont, a region which has been sacred to indigenous people for thousands of years. The Western Abenaki are the traditional caretakers of these lands and waters. We respect their connection to this region and remember the hardships they continue to endure. And lastly, we give thanks for the opportunity to share this place and we'll endeavor to work to protect it. And with that, I will turn it over to our Master of Ceremonies, Tom Jimicello. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to see the kickoff of our eight program presentation year for the Green Mountain Audubon Society. I will be uh, giving you a little bit of a background on the rest of the programs this year, which you can find on our Green Mountain Audubon uh, main website. Just click under events and you'll see almost all of them are listed. As we approach, all of them will have uh, participation just like this one did with Eventbrite. So we have this year, I'd like to publicly thank the Liza Morse, who has joined me on the programs committee, and Sarah Schmidt. And what Liza has done is tremendous. Uh, she is a young woman scientist studying at UVM, and she has actually lined up three other young women scientists. So I'm very pleased to, to be able to have uh, a program this year, a program selection that is gonna focus on both Vermont and now, and also focus on what these young women scientists are doing. Tonight's presentation is by a friend of ours, a friend of mine, Zach Coda. Zach has agreed to be the kickoff and the uh, last uh, closer, kickoff and closer for our eight programs. I have known Zach for quite a few years. When I met him, he was just a young little beginning birder. And now he has progressed to what I consider expert status. Zach's uh, passion is the outside and connecting people with nature. He has done that in his personal life and he has done that in some of his professional life. He has worked for North Branch Nature Center. He has studied, uh, he's currently doing a master's program. And uh, in the future, he will, I'm sure, continue to travel with his partner. They were out in the West and he was learning and doing all sorts of good things. But tonight we're happy that he is here in Vermont and he's going to entertain us and treat us to a program called Winter Birds and a Winter Bird Primer. So without any further ado, I will take over the job of letting people in and introduce to you our friend, Zach Coda. Take it away, Zach. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, uh, Green Mountain Audubon Society for having me. It's such a pleasure to join you all again. Um, and to see so many people that are joining us on a, a, a cold, dark winter day. Um, but what I think is still a perfect day for getting out there and enjoying birds. Um, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is all about the joys of winter birding. I feel like it's um, often an underappreciated time in the year. We're so used to getting out in the spring when birds are returning from the tropics and singing and the summer when it's beautiful conditions and there are bird nests to be found and young birds around and, and even the fall migration. But winter, despite the sometimes bleak conditions, has a lot of surprises in store. And that's what I'm gonna share with you tonight. Uh, some of the birds that we have here in Vermont that will uh, linger all year round and through the harsh winter conditions, but also uh, some of the surprising things that folks may not have encountered um, before. As Tom said, my passion is, is really getting out in nature and exploring, finding new things, but also sharing those things with others. Um, and I've been fortunate to do that um, in a number of organizations here in Vermont. 
Um, and uh, happy to join Green Mountain Audubon tonight in sharing all about winter birds with you. Zach, before you get started, I forgot to mention. We're going to talk about things. what birds are here in the winter time, what birds stay here that were here before, and what birds come here to spend the winter. Um, how exactly they're getting through the harsh conditions of winter, and then how do we get out and enjoy them? How do we? How do people study? Um, birds in the winter and how can we protect them? Zach, can I bump in? Just I, I forgot to tell so people the how to ask questions. Struggles okay? of winter uh, are myriad for birds. They they really focus on access to resources. In the winter time, there's less food available, particularly for birds that primarily eat insects. Um, that insect supply might still be there, but it's not as readily accessible to them, hidden underneath snow or hidden um, behind bark or other places. There's limited access to water. So even in wintertime, birds need to be drinking water. So finding places where they can access that is difficult. Um, snow can be really hard to deal with. Other precipitation is tough. Um, in cold conditions, they need more calories to survive, which means eating more food. And there's also increased exposure to predators. So in the summertime, when there are lots of leaves around, it's relatively easy to hide from predators. But in the wintertime and stick season, it can be really difficult to stay hidden and stay safe. A few different ways that birds are going about surviving the winter. The, the first is simply to migrate, to get out of here. So many of the, the birds of summer that we enjoy, so things like tanagers and grosbeaks and warblers, a lot of those birds are neotropic migrants, meaning they're going to migrate all the way to Central and South America to avoid winter and essentially have summer year round. So that migration takes them to a place where they don't have to deal with these harsh conditions, where there's plentiful food, but there's also some risk involved. Migration is pretty taxing on a bird, even one that's well prepared. So um, escaping winter comes with some challenges as well. Other birds may just move around. So rather than migrating for thousands of miles, other birds may move locally to find better conditions than where they spent the summer. Some birds are undergoing physical changes. So some of these changes have evolved over time and other physical changes are happening from season to season. There are also behavioral adaptations that birds are undergoing. So they're changing the way they go about their day. They're changing the way they um, find food. The places they go for shelter are changing during the winter. And they're also adjusting their diet, which is something that a lot of birds that are here in the winter will do. If they live here in the summer as well, they have a whole different food source. There are um, often fresh uh, berries and seeds. There are insects around uh, that they can eat. There's fresh vegetation for the herbivores. So um, in the winter time, they have to adapt uh, to a whole different host of food sources. We're going to look at um, surviving winter through three sets of birds. So I'm going to call them the, the stalwarts first. Those are the birds we have around in the wintertime that are truly adapted to living in the north. They're birds that uh, we might see all year, things like chickadees and cardinals and titmice that um, are around in the summer, but also make it through our winters. Then we're going we're gonna to talk about some stragglers. So birds that we typically think about as migrating south in the winter, but Members of those species may, in fact, survive and linger well into the winter and make it through an entire winter if they can find the right resources. And then we're going to talk about the sojourners. These are the really um, exciting birds that are special because they're not here year round. We're not used to seeing them, but when they show up, they can show up in impressive numbers and in unexpected places. This is a, a good frame of reference. I created this some years ago for the winter bird count. Um, 
which I'll talk about toward the end, but that season is coming up. Um, it was founded 124 years ago um, by Frank Chapman. There's, um, it's been maintained by the Audubon Society ever since. It happens from December 14th through January 5th every year in circles um, around the Americas. Um, so for many people, the, the winter bird count or the Christmas bird count season is, is only a week away. As part of that count, there are many people watching bird feeders and keeping track of birds at, at feeders. And I realized that some of the people wanting to participate didn't have access to a good resource. So I uh, didn't have a good field guide. Um, and while there are resources readily available online, they can be difficult to comb through. So I wanted to make essentially something that folks could glance at at a um, while they're watching their bird feeder and see um, see kind of the diversity of birds they might find and be able to pick out what's in front of them. Um, so this is a, a really good tool to look at. These are a lot of the stalwarts. These are the birds that are here in Vermont in the summer for the most part and are surviving throughout the winter. And these are the birds you're most likely to see at a bird feeder. So if you're wanting to enjoy birds in the winter, I recommend starting with these ones, getting really familiar with these birds because these are the ones you're most likely to see sort of um, out and around, but also at your bird feeders. And I see, it looks like there is already some folks in the chat and um, I'm going to have Tom sort of uh, navigate um, the chat feature. And uh, folks can ask questions as we go. So if there's a, if there's something that folks are interested in in a certain slide, feel free to ask in the chat or Tom can pause me. Um, and that way we can answer that while we're looking at the pertinent slide. But there might be other questions that are more appropriate to wait till the end. Um, so feel free to either uh, stop us if there's a question you have about a specific slide, or if you'd rather wait, um, we'll do a bigger question and answer period at the end. So what is allowing these stalwarts to survive through these harsh conditions? Well, the, the first thing about birds are that we notice are their feathers. So in the winter time, birds are growing extra feathers and they're specifically growing these extra downy feathers. Birds can have quite a few different feathers. There are feathers that they use for flight and these are bigger, stiffer feathers um, like tail and flight feathers you see on the bottom left. But they also have these more fluffy semi-plume and downy feathers. The semi-plume feathers are also called contour feathers. They're the feathers that we see making up the bird's body but the downy feathers are underneath and they're super fluffy and they hold a lot of air. And that trapped air that is um, around and underneath those feathers is going to retain heat. So air is really good at insulating and feathers are really good at trapping that, that warm air. So if you think about a lot of these big puffy jackets that we wear in the winter time um, are full of of bird feathers, these downy feathers that are really good at trapping air. And birds can actually control um, how much air is trapped by using little tiny muscles that are attached to their feathers. So those semi-plume or contour feathers that really trap that air in there, they can control how um, much room they take up. So you can notice birds looking, um, so a, a cardinal, for example, cardinals can look really sleek and trim, or they can look really puffy and big and round. Um, but chances are they haven't changed in their weight or dimensions um, other than just moving their feathers. So um, throughout the program, I'll try and point out some birds that are clearly puffed up uh, to retain more heat and insulation. So one bird in particular that you know we are very familiar with that survives all winter long is the black-capped chickadee. So this is a bird you might see out in the forest, but also visiting your bird feeder. 
it has a couple of really amazing physical adaptations that allow it to survive. So black capped chickadees um, can actually control the blood flow to their legs and their feet so that in cold conditions, uh, it retains heat as much as possible and its toes can actually go all the way to the freezing point. So it can restrict the blood flow and have its toes go all the way down to like 30 degrees Fahrenheit in an effort to keep the heat in its core and not in its feet, which are bare and not covered with feathers. And it also has some amazing mechanisms for finding food. So black cap chickadees will create a mental map of their surroundings, of places where they've either stored food or places they know they can find food, such as bird feeders. And chickadees can hold hundreds and even thousands of these locations in their head, but it takes a lot of brain space. So that sort of geospatial um, learning happens in a, a place called the hippocampus and the um, that part of the bird's brain can actually grow by some 30% in the fall as it's preparing to learn all these locations where food is available. So that, um, that plasticity, that ability to learn and grow um, brain volume is really critically important to chickadees finding enough food to survive the winter. Another tiny bird that somehow manages to survive through the, the cold northern winter is a golden crowned kinglet. And um, they really are, I think, the champion of winter survivorship. Uh, they're absolutely tiny. So they're smaller than a ping pong ball and weigh about the same as two pennies. Uh, they are strictly insect eaters. So even in the winter time, they are finding tiny little caterpillars, tiny little larvae that are overwintering attached to bark, attached to the underside of, of leaves and needles. They are going around gleaning these little tiny larvae off of um, plants. And they need to uh, have enough uh, food every day to maintain a body temperature of about 110 degrees. No matter what, even if it gets to 30 below zero, they need that 100 degree, 110 degree body temperature. So it has a couple tricks to doing this. The first is simply that it, it feeds constantly. If you ever see a flock of kinglets, they are in constant motion. That's because they're they're fighting the clock every day. They have just enough daylight to find enough food to survive the long, cold winter night. So they're constantly feeding, and they're often in a small group. And that group is allowing them to locate food more easily. So one kinglet might come across um, a group of overwintering insect larvae, and it's going to make these little contact calls. It's going to let the other members of its group know that it's found some food, and they'll come over and be able to eat as well. But throughout the day, they're also looking for a place to spend the night. So as they're foraging for insects, they're also keeping track of places where they could keep warm or at least sheltered in the night. So they might uh, stumble upon, say, um, a dense uh, bough in a hemlock tree, or they might come across an old woodpecker nest, and they'll know that when it gets almost dark, it's time to retreat to that spot. So they'll call to each other, and they'll go back to that place, and they'll actually huddle together like you see on the bottom left, and they'll share their body heat. Um, the, they'll actually take turns sort of rotating, um, similar to what we know penguins do, right? So the birds on the outside don't get cold all night long. They'll, they'll switch positions. They'll tuck their heads underneath their wings to hold in heat. Um, and they'll, they'll also um, expend a tremendous amount of calories um, to stay warm all night long. Uh, sometimes they'll lose up to half their body weight um, just 
staying warm all night long. So each day, these kinglets have to eat, um, have to regain half of their body weight um, through eating just these tiny little insects. Um, and despite these pretty amazing adaptations and this constant struggle for food, um, up to like 80% of kinglets will not survive through a winter. So there's an incredible turnover of these birds. Um, with 80% not surviving a winter, you would think, how are there, how did are there any kinglets at all? And that's because they're so good at reproducing in the summer. Kinglets can have six, seven, eight, nine young in a clutch and can have two or three or sometimes four clutches in a summer, depending on how available food is. So from year to year, there could be as much as 80% turnover in the kinglet population. Another bird that's gonna um, survive the winter by kind of huddling away are woodpeckers. So we, we think of woodpeckers as building holes for nests, but they'll also build winter roosts. Woodpeckers are fairly territorial, so they'll have an area that they live in, and they'll build a nest in the summertime, but in the wintertime, they will build, construct winter roosts throughout their territory. So they might have one site that they use as a nest in the summer, that's often built in a, a live tree, but they'll have five or six or seven winter roosts that they can rotate through in their territory. And these roosts, unlike um, nest cavities, are, are built in dead tr standing trees. So they can be constructed quite hastily. In fact, um, larger woodpeckers can build a winter roost cavity in as little as one day. Um, so they're pretty flexible in their accommodations. And then those winter roosts can be used by other animals. So things like brown creeper, which are here all year round, um, will use the winter roosts of woodpecker sometimes. So another bird that we see a lot more often in the summertime, um, but is here year round, is the ruffed grouse. So ruffed grouse, also called partridge, uh, in the summertime are eating a lot of berries and they're eating things often found on the ground, but in the wintertime, they're foraging up higher. So they might be easily missed. Um, they eat a lot of seeds and a lot of fruit um, from the tops of trees. Um, and then they're finding a place often on the ground to spend the winter. And one pretty amazing thing um, that rough grouse will do is actually bury themselves in snow. So they can um, they can dig a little bit of a tunnel, but when it's snowing, they'll also just sit still and let the snow accumulate on top of them. And that snow, just like a bird's feathers, traps in air and uh, insulates the bird. It also keeps the rough grouse hidden from predators. So um, great horned owls, and uh, northern goshawk both love to eat rough grouse. So if it's hidden just underneath the layer of snow, it's a lot harder for those birds of prey to find. Um, Bernd Heinrich, who did a lot of the research on kinglets, also did some interesting research on rough grouse and found um, these little snow caves where grouse had been hiding. And you can in the wintertime, I'm sure some of you have had this experience, either snowshoeing through um, a snowy forest or skiing through a forest, and out of nowhere, there's an explosion of snow, and it's a rough grouse that had been hiding underneath the snow and flew up as you approached. And if you go over there, you can actually estimate how long the grouse had been in there. Uh, Burnt calculated that rough grouse um, will uh, excrete about 3.7 fecal pellets per hour. So he um, calculated, could calculate how long uh, rough grouse had been in their snow den by uh, counting the fecal pellets that were in the den after it flew away. And he found where some grouse had been in one single snow den for up to 16 hours. Uh, so it's pretty amazing. These birds can really hunker down um, in the cold winter night or if there's a, a pretty big snowstorm happening. 
Uh, other birds have been documented using snow dens too. Even smaller birds like red poles will sometimes uh, bury underneath the snow uh, to stay out of the cold, to insulate. Um, the problem for these small birds is if it warms up and then freezes again, that crust on the snow can freeze them underneath and they won't be able to escape. But the rough grouse is big enough that it can force its way up and out through even a little bit of crust. Another bird that we um, are used to seeing in, uh, in the summertime uh, is the wild turkey. And people will say, I you know, will say, I wonder where the turkeys went that were in my area. And they are really changing where they live seasonally. So they're um, coming together to form groups that are foraging. They're, they're looking for things like old orchards where they can um, find fruits and berries uh, to eat. And they're roosting communally in large conifers. So the turkeys will actually fly up high into pine trees um, and other conifers, which are places that are relatively sheltered from the snow and also uh, from the, the rain and the wind and um, provide some protection from predators too. Some other birds that we see in the winter that are, are hanging out um, in water bodies are both diving ducks and dabbling ducks. So diving ducks like the common merganser on the left, they need um, access to uh, areas to dive for fish. So rivers, but also um, areas in, in lakes. And they can take advantage of even the smallest little slip of water. So I've seen mergansers hunting successfully in areas like the Winooski River, the Mad River, the Lamoille River, um, even when there's only a tiny little lead left. If they have enough space to get down under the ice and hunt for fish, they can make a living there. Uh, dabbling ducks like mallards and American black ducks often need um, conditions that have a little bit more, um, a little bit more edge or a little bit shallower areas where there might be some vegetation down below. But still in the winter, you can get really big groups of mallards and black ducks um, and other dabblers uh, hanging out. Some other places to look are like wastewater treatment plants will often host uh, groups of ducks in the winter. Any place that has open water and is relatively warm, they'll, they'll find it. A couple birds that um, are changing their behavior are crows and ravens. Um, crows in the fall will start to gather together in these really big winter roosts, which are called murders. Um, and they're, they can be pretty impressive as there are thousands and thousands of birds strong that will occupy just a small patch of trees. Um, and during the day, they'll disperse and go out and, and look for food. But at night, they're coming back to this roost and you can see just a steady stream of crows flying into the roost um, from all directions. And it has a couple of functions. It, um, it, which are mainly for communication. So birds can, the, the crows can uh, share information about predators. So if there's an owl, they'll be able to quickly find the owl and, and everyone can mob it and hopefully drive the owl away. But they're also sharing information about food. So birds will, will tell each other where the food is so that the next day when they disperse from the roost, um, they can follow individuals that found food or food sources the, the day before. Um, and it's really amazing to track these movements over time. So track how many crows are coming to a roost. So maybe the roost sites are moving um, from year to year or even from day to day. And there's a really cool project that um, Bridget Butler helps uh, start on iNaturalist called Crows in Vermont and folks can um, report uh, pictures of crow roosts. Um, there are some pretty famous crow roosts in the Burlington area. Um, there had been one that was in Centennial Woods and then sort of moved onto the UVM campus. 
Um, so there were like huge flocks of uh, thousands of crows kind of all around UVM campus for a while. Um, there are some pretty impressive roosts up in St. Albans as well. And uh, relative to crows are, are ravens, and they're changing their behavior a little bit too. Um, they're able to kind of um, forage for all sorts of different foods year round. But in the winter time, they really rely on things like roadkill and other predators to find their food. So they'll actually follow things like coyotes to um, sites where animals have been killed and um, badger them until they give up their catch. Um, and I've seen them do this with other rap with um, raptors too. So things like red-tailed hawks, if a red-tailed hawk um, has got a, a prey, I've seen uh, ravens sort of following it and pestering it until it gives up its prey. We've got um, quite a few raptors here that um, are here year round and uh, survive in winter by sort of changing their behavior a little bit and maybe moving locally. So Cooper's hawks, which um, we think of sort of as a forest hawk, um, will move more into urban or agricultural areas where there are big um, uh, access to uh, prey. So they might be chasing after pigeons or starlings. They might be tracking through um, suburban areas looking for bird feeders. And the Cooper's hawks and sharp-shinned hawks can keep track of these places. So if you have a bird feeder and you're seeing a Cooper's hawk, um, it's likely the same bird that is um, on a rotation. So it's doing laps where it knows there are bird feeders and it will um, either kind of hang out in the distance where it's barely visible to the birds at the feeders and then swoop in, or it sometimes will fly pretty fast through a neighborhood and hopefully just come around a corner and surprise some birds unexpectedly and snag one. So if you ever are looking at your bird feeder and see all the birds have frozen, it looks like, you know, they are suspended in time. I've seen woodpeckers like perched on a tree and perfectly still. Um, it's a good idea to look around and see maybe there's a Cooper's hawk that's sitting in a tree nearby and the birds are hoping to um, stay hidden from it. Another one that is uh, really beautiful to watch hunting over our open fields are northern harrier northern harriers so these are birds that are here um, to some extent in the summer um, but are a little bit easier to to find in the winter as they're kind of congregating in more agricultural areas they have these super long wings and a really long tail and they hunt by just doing slow, lazy arcs low over fields until they spot something like a mouse and they'll make a quick turn and dive right down onto the prey. And you'll see these birds often in the Champlain Valley um, just over fields and they will swap um, shifts with another bird that I'll talk about later, the short-eared owl. So it's really fun in the winter to see Northern Harriers and short-eared owls sort of changing the guard um, at dusk. One raptor that we have um, all year round is the red-tailed hawk. Um, red-tailed hawks change their behavior a little bit in that they're scavenging more in the winter. So you might see red-tailed hawks taking advantage of roadkill and, and other things. Um, but we also have several subspecies of red-tailed hawk. So, we are used to having the Borealis red-tailed hawk, which you see on the bottom left. It has a bit of a dark band around its chest, um, and it has a little bit of a dark edge on the on the leading edge of its or on the on the trailing edge of its wing. But the other subspecies that we see in winter is Abeticola, and these will move south in the winter. So we'll have both subspecies of red-tailed hawk, and you can pick them out. Um, if you study them close enough, the abeticola has a much darker band around its belly that has almost these large, big globular um, dots on it. It has a little bit darker upper parts and head and that 
trailing um, edge of the wing has these a really dark band on it. Um, and it even will sometimes have a, a dark trailing edge of its tail as well. So if you're looking at a red-tailed hawk in the winter, it can be a, a fun challenge to try and figure out, is it a borealis that maybe was here all summer long and is overwintering? Or is it an abedicola um, that maybe was uh, far north in Canada and has moved south for the winter? We have some owls that are spending the winter here. Um, and barred owl is the, our most common owl. We're really familiar with it year round, but um, in the winter time, it might be a little bit more active during the day. So as food becomes um, more scarce and conditions change, um, it might need to forage um, for food for longer. So we're seeing them out during the day. Sometimes we're seeing them visiting bird feeders or working sort of the edges of fields or the edges of roads looking for prey. Um, you might even see a barred owl sitting on a, like a um, electric or a telephone wire um, along a road looking for, for small rodents. Winter is also a great time to go looking for great horned owls. Great horned owls can be a little bit secretive during the breeding season and during the summer. But in the winter, it's a little bit easier to spot them um, while they're roosting. So that uh, bottom left is a great horned owl roosting during the day. And it's just sitting on a branch sort of in a little bit of a, some thick vegetation. So it's a bit hidden, um, but it's still um, still visible if you're looking close enough to, to likely roost spots. And then at, at twilight, you can catch um, great horned owls either in the evening or in the morning as they're either coming out for the night or, or going away for the day. Um, and they're really big birds. So they stand out if you see one and the profile with those two ear tufts um, is, is pretty classic. So um, on the either end of the, of the night, you might catch a great horned owl as it's uh, moving around. So now we're gonna move from the stalwarts, those birds that we're used to seeing um, year round to some of the stragglers. So these are birds that we see in the summer and we think of as migrating south, but really um, will stick around much later in the season. And as we talked about, migration um, is really costly. It's uh, It takes a lot of calories, it takes a lot of energy, but it's also dangerous. And so some birds will try and stay in the north and and see how long they can survive into the winter before they have to move south. And they might move south only as far as they need to, to have the resources it takes to survive the winter. So one of those is hermit thrush. We think of hermit thrush as a winter bird, but we often see hermit thrush lingering into snowfall and sometimes hanging out through the winter bird count period. So um, through the end of December and into early January. Some birds uh, that you might see well into winter are, are lots of different waterfowl. So Canada geese might migrate south, but others might stay. Um, similar uh, great blue heron, if it can find places to get fish, so open water, it, it will stay here even if there's ice all around it. Uh, common loon will stick around late too, as long as it has open water. Common loon need a really long takeoff stretch in order to get into flight. Um, so the danger for loons is uh, if that area, um, say they're on a pond and the area of ice closes in around them, it might close in to the point where they can no longer take off. And eventually it'll close in to the point where they, they can't, um, can't get into the water at all. Um, and so some loons have had to be rescued off of smaller lakes and ponds as they start to freeze up. Um, these birds are staying further north because they're also closer to the places where they're going to have a nest. So uh, Canada geese and common loon are very territorial um, in the breeding season. So the sooner they can get to that lake or pond or wetland where they're going to nest, the better chance they have of staking a claim. 
And similarly, the, the great blue heron, it has a limited um, access to resource, uh, a nesting resource, which would be at a rookery. So um, getting north, getting into position for the breeding season as early as possible is gonna help it have its best chance at nesting. So these birds really wanna stay as far north as possible um, and not migrate if they don't have to. Some sparrows will also hang out. So we think of song sparrow as a summer bird and most of them do migrate south, but some will stick around well into the winter or even make it through the winter. And good places to look for these um, sparrows are in agricultural areas. So if you go out to the Champlain Valley, along roadsides, hedgerows, um, and uh, farmyards, uh, you might find song sparrows even in the worst winter conditions. And it's really about accessing food. And it's sort of like the great blue heron where um, they are looking for a place to start a nest as soon as they can in the spring. So being close to that spot is going to be helpful to them in setting up a territory. Robins and bluebirds are often thought of as migrating south for the winter. You know, people talk about the first robin of spring, but really robins are in Vermont year round. Both of these species will they'll move locally um, in order to find food and to find warmer spots. So if you live at a high elevation or in Northern Vermont, you may not have robins in your area in the winter, but if you go, say, to an orchard in the Champlain Valley, where there are lots of fruit trees, you may find even hundreds of robins hanging out there, spending the winter so that they're close to their breeding habitat. Um, and similarly, bluebirds will change their diet. Um, in the breeding season, bluebirds are eating a lot of insects, um, which are packed with protein, um, are super calorie dense, um, in the wintertime, they're eating more fruits and berries. So bluebirds might not be that far. They might have just gone down the road to places where there are ornamental fruit trees that they can eat. Some other species that are um, known to sort of linger um, regularly are things like yellow-rumped warbler, which is one of the um, one of the unique warblers in that it will eat insects, but it will also eat berries. So here it is um, munching on a juniper and you can go out to areas along Lake Champlain where there are lots of junipers and find groups of yellow rumped warblers even in January. Um, winter wrens, despite their name, often are migrating south. So many winter wrens are migrating south for the winter, um, but you can still find them hanging out um, in, uh, in warmer areas. And I had one yesterday um, up in the Russell Green Preserve in Georgia, Vermont. So it's a really a little bit warmer of an area um, and it uh, has lots of good shelter. And this winter wren was kind of hanging out in amongst some cattails, um, trying, to, trying to see how long it could make it into the winter. And more and more frequently, yellow-bellied sapsuckers too are, are finding ways to make it through the winter. And they're changing their food source. So sap from trees might not be readily accessible, but they're um, showing up to bird feeders and eating suet, um, or they're gleaning insects from uh, tree bark. And really it can run the gambit of birds that are straggling late into winter. So um, blackbirds, Baltimore Oriole, uh, Scarlet Tanager, Rose-breasted Grosbeaks have all been recorded lingering um, through December and, and into late, um, even into late winter, trying to survive. And it's really a matter of them uh, finding shelter and finding food. So uh, most of these birds show up at, um, are, are found at bird feeders um, where they have uh, ready access to food. Uh, so keep an eye out on your bird feeders. You might see an unexpected surprise. Uh, a lot of these birds will um, linger a little bit later into the fall and then migrate south, but some will actually try and overwinter. Now we're going to move on to the last group, the sojourners. Um, these are our birds that 
are not here any other time of the year that are really special because they are a winter treat. Um, they are found, there's a, a huge variety of these birds. They're found in all different habitats. They come in all different shapes and sizes. And these are the birds that really make winter birding exciting and motivate me and so many other people to getting out there. Uh, this bird is a great gray owl. It's one of our few uh, eruptive owls, meaning um, it might not show up in Vermont every winter, but every once in a while is moving south um, to uh, find food when there's less food available further north where it, it spends most of its time. One group that are um, frequently encountered, especially out by the lake, are ducks. So we have a lot of duck species that are not found here in the summer and are spending the winter um, in Vermont and places further south. Um, things like scoters. So up on the right, there are white-winged scoters. There are two other scoter species, black scoters and surf scoters. Uh, these are really big um, seagoing ducks. If you were to go out um, to the ocean, you could see huge rafts of these scoters um, during the winter time. but some will um, make a living in Lake Champlain. So it's really exciting to be able to go um, out and find these big groups of sea ducks. Uh, along with them, we'll see things like um, golden eye, we'll see scop, we'll see this beautiful long-tailed duck down in the middle there. And sometimes we'll even see rarities, like on the right uh, in the foreground, there's uh, a barrow's golden eye. Um, it's a relative of our common golden eye, which we see frequently in the winter. But Barrow's golden eye live further to the west. So we might only get to see one or two of those um, a year in Vermont. Um, and it's really exciting to, to pick one out in a big group of scop and golden eye. It's sort of like finding a needle in a haystack. And then on the left is another fun bird that's not a, a duck, but relative to um, loons is a horned grebe. Uh, and horned grebes are, are fishing all winter long out on Lake Champlain. So if you go to places like uh, Shalott Town Beach or Shelburne Bay, you might be able, able to spy one of these tiny little grebes just constantly diving, looking for small fish to eat. A lot of these other ducks, though, are, are eating things like uh, mussels or, or other invertebrates that it's finding um, on the bottom of the sea, of the lake bed. We have some geese that are coming through, some of which that are also staying here all winter long. Um, folks are familiar with snow geese um, and they've moved a little bit. We used to have huge flocks of snow geese that would come in the fall through Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area in Addison. And now they're uh, tending more toward the New York side of the lake, but you can still see thousands of snow geese in flight over Vermont in the late fall and early winter, some of whom that will stay a little bit later into the winter as well. We're also increasingly finding rare geese that are coming from Europe and making their way to New England. And I'm going to talk about this in my presentation in the spring. Um, on April 18th, I'm going to be talking with Green Mountain Audubon all about rare birds of Vermont. Um, and one of the things that's happening is um, these rare geese, rare waterfowl, and other rare birds are showing up more frequently um, from Eurasia. And there's a thought that um, climate change and uh, changes in breeding habitat are driving this um, sort of increase in European species ending up in the, in the Northeast of North America, um, which is a real treat for us because it means we can see things like this pink-footed goose down on the left. Um, it, you, it was very exciting when Vermont had its first pink-footed goose. Um, you know, it was super unexpected. What is this European goose doing here um, in this flock of Canada geese? And now it seems like it's become an annual thing where there's, you know, a pink footed goose somewhere in Vermont. Um, I was traveling through Connecticut, um, uh, traveling through Massachusetts 
um, recently, and uh, there was a group of three pink-footed geese um, all together um, with Canada geese. And right down the road, there was another rare goose called a barnacle goose. So um, these uh, European geese are increasingly showing up for with flocks of Canada geese and sometimes staying for weeks or months. Um, similar to waterfowl, we're getting uh, uh, rare northern gulls that are moving south. So um, in big flocks of more common gulls like ring-billed gull and herring gull, you might find things like this Iceland gull on the right or the glaucus gull on the left, um, both of which uh, are living, breeding further north, but are moving south in the winter. Um, they can be found uh, anywhere that large groups of gulls are accumulating. And one place to, to look for them in particular are commercial composts. So both of these gulls were at the former grow compost site down in Middlesex. Um, I know that when there was a commercial compost operation in the intervale, um, these birds would regularly show up in the winter um, and are, well, it doesn't, goal watching doesn't excite many people. Um, it's a real treasure, like on a winter bird count to be able to find these species that um, are living most of their lives much farther north. Uh, one real treat of the winter for me are is the return of short-eared owls. So these are owls that have been known to breed in Vermont um, in grasslands, but most of the breeding population is further north in the tundra. And they're really coming back to Vermont in, in early no to late November um, and spending the winter out in big open grassland areas. So if you go out to um, Dead Creek in Addison, you can see um, sometimes multiple short-eared owls um, in an evening, and um, they'll stay there all winter long hunting over fields. And this is the species that we see sometimes interacting with northern harriers. So they use the same habitat, they're hunting for the same prey, the northern harrier is on the day shift, the short-eared owl is on the night shift, and sometimes right at dusk, you'll get to see a northern harrier and a short-eared owl hunting in the same area and even fighting over prey. This is definitely a favorite um, in Vermont birding and a, a, a favorite anywhere is the snowy owl. And unlike short-eared owls, which are fairly um, consistent and regular in terms of coming to Vermont, Snowy owls may fluctuate widely from year to year. So some years we might not have any snowy owls in Vermont. And a few years ago, we had an absolutely incredible eruption of snowy owls um, where you could see more than a dozen um, individual snowy owls in one day um, in the right place out in Addison. And really this is this, this a cyclical trend is related to their prey. So snowy owls are, are raising their young in the Arctic tundra, uh, feeding them small rodents like lemmings. In a good year, they might be able to raise, um, an average year, they might have three or four young that they're able to raise to adulthood. But in a big lemming year, so a year where there are lots of lemmings around, they might be able to raise uh, four or five or six young owls. And come winter, when there's less prey available, that um, surplus that the, all of those um, extra young owls get forced south um, by the adults. So you can see many young owls, like the one on the upper right, um, young owls, particularly young um, female snowy owls, are really dark and have a lot of the black feathers, uh, black tipped feathers. So some years we're seeing snowy owl eruptions because there's been a lot of breeding and there are a lot of young owls. And other years we'll have snowy owl eruptions where there are a lot of mature owls. And those are years where the lemming population has crashed and there's not enough food to survive even um, on the breeding territory. So the adult owls will move farther south. 
And those are years where we see a lot of adult birds um, in uh, places like the Champlain Valley. A similar um, uh, Arctic tundra breeder as the rough-legged hawk. And uh, these are birds that are pretty reliable um, in the wintertime in Vermont. They're coming in November and they're staying through March. Um, it's a really fun bird to see hunting because they have this unique um, style where they'll actually hover by flapping their wings. So they'll, they'll stay perfectly still, but constantly in motion. So they'll be flapping and hovering perfectly before diving down onto a prey. And um, they come in two different color morphs. So on the bottom left, there is a light morphed um, rough-legged hawk. You can see it has a, a dark uh, band across its belly, but it's pretty light overall with a lot of gray and brown speckling and a sort of lighter gray head. It also has these two dark patches sort of on the bend of its wing on the underside. And on the right, there's a dark morphed um, rough-legged hawk, which is pretty dark overall with a little bit of silver on the backside of its, its wing. Um, and it also has a particular style of um, perching in the tiniest, wispiest branches at the very tip tops of trees, um, which is different from the way a red-tailed hawk perches. Red-tailed hawks often perch on bigger branches, sort of in the mid level on the outside of a tree um, versus a rough-legged being at the very tippy top of a tree on a spindly little branch. So sometimes you can look across a field and tell which hawk species is out there um, just by the way it's perched um, in a tree. Another Arctic visitor is the Northern Shrike. Um, this is an amazing little bird because it is a predator, but it's not a raptor. It's actually a songbird and it's related to our vireos. And you can sort of tell it's related to vireos because it has that little hook at the end of its beak like a vireo has. And while vireos use that hook to spear insects, um, shrikes use them to spear things like small mammals and other birds. Um, you often see it, it's about the size of a blue jay. You often see it perching sort of up high in small trees or in brush. And it has a, a really nasty habit of singing to other birds to try and call them in and eat them. So you can see sometimes a shrike perched right out in the open and you'll hear it singing and it's not trying to find a mate. It's trying to call in other birds that it can chase down and eat. Um, it doesn't have the talons like a raptor has. So in order to eat its prey, it often has to find a, a sharp thorn or a barbed wire to hang the prey off of and then dismember it. And it gets the nickname, the butcher bird from that uh, technique. This is a set of three birds. I like to call the field birds. Um, and these are birds of open plains that um, spend the summer in the Arctic nesting and then migrate south for the winter and are found in big open areas, uh, sometimes on the sides of, of roads, sometimes in uh, stubbly cornfields. And it's the snow bunting, the horned lark, and the Lapland longspur. And they're often found in mixed flocks together. Uh, so when you find one, you might find two or even three species. In the top right, you can see the snow buntings have a lot of white on them. Um, and they have those black wing tips that contrast with that um, white in their body. And then the horned larks are mostly brown, but they have a beautiful yellow tinge to their face with some black stripe around their, a black mask around their face and a big black band around their breast. And then the Lapland longspur looks more like a sparrow. It's sort of brown overall with a little bit of creamy color on its face and neck. Um, a little bit of rusty color on its wings um, and a sort of lighter color underneath. So these are three birds to learn um, together and to look for out in big uh, open fields in the winter time. We have a couple of sparrows that come through Vermont and will spend the winter here. 
Uh, the American tree sparrow is one that is only here in the winter. They're breeding further north and coming down in the fall and spending the winter. You might see them at your bird feeders. Uh, they have a really gray face with a red cap and they have a, a dark spot in the middle of a kind of clean gray um, breast. And then that bill is a two colored bill. The top part is dark brown and the uh, or even black appearing and the under part is this bright yellow or orange. So that's a pretty good giveaway about a tree sparrow. From the other side, and you can just see it in this photo, there are um, is a little white stripe along the outside of its wing. And then the other sparrow we have in Vermont in the winter time is the white-throated sparrow. So these will nest in Vermont, but large numbers of them will kind of migrate south in the fall, and some of them will stay here through the winter as well. And these are two really exciting birds, um, one of which we have all year long, the cedar waxwing, but in the winter we get its cousin, the bohemian wax waxwing. And this is a, a truly stunning bird. Um, it has the most subtle, elegant colors. Uh, it has this beautiful sort of rusty undertail, which matches a rusty color in its face. And if you look at the wing, it has those waxy red tips on its uh, wing feathers. Uh, they love to eat uh, ornamental uh, trees. So this is a bird that sometimes you can find in large flocks, even in urban areas. So uh, places like um, I've seen them in places like malls or uh, hospitals where there might be parking lots that have lots of ornamental fruit trees. Um, those are good places to actually scout out and look for wax wings um, that are eating uh, berries. Another berry eater is the pine grosbeak. Pine grosbeaks nest um, in the north and are moving south. Um, when there are no more um, food crops available to them in uh, the winter and further north. So this is a bird that might show up a little bit later in the winter, um, but also in those ornamental fruit trees if the, uh, if the bohemian waxwings haven't eaten them all out. And the relative of the pine grosbeak is the evening grosbeak. Um, that's a bird that will nest here in Vermont um, but large groups of them are moving south in the winter, and it's really nomadic. The flocks of them are moving all around trying to find access to food, um, and they'll show up uh, even at bird feeders. Uh, evening grosbeaks are, have declined quite substantially, so they're, they are, um, have a, declined like 92% since the 1970s, and they're the fastest declining land bird in North America. And there's a group called the Finch Research Network um, that is devoted to studying all finches, but um, has a project specifically dedicated to uh, helping um, the evening grosbeak recover. Um, so that would be a, a great resource for folks looking to learn more about evening grosbeaks and other finches is the Finch Research Network. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about their finch forecast um, as we go through this section. Um, for those wondering uh, about um, eruptions of specific birds, every year the Finch Research Network um, studies the crops of different fruit and seed trees and predicts movements of finches that are coming south. Um, so they just released their annual finch forecast. And so pine grosbeaks, it looks like the mountain ash crop further north, um, which they like to eat is abundant. So our chances of getting big fallouts of pine grosbeaks are pretty low this year, but there have been already big movements of evening grosbeaks around. So keep an eye out for them. Um, white ring uh, and red crossbills um, are birds that um, we might see in, in large numbers from year to year. Red crossbills will nest here. Um, and white crossbell, white wing crossbells are more of a winter treat. Um, the red crossbill uh, is a really fascinating species because it's made up of 10 or more different types um, or subspecies. And these types can be identified by their call. 
Um, and it's interesting because we think of subspecies typically as occupying a specific geographic area and becoming distinct um, that way. But red crossbills will nest at any time of the year. So they're um, eating uh, seeds from like pine cones. That bill that goes across is, is specifically adapted to prying open the cones of a pine tree. So it will pry those open and use its tongue to get the little seed out. And they will travel in groups anywhere there's food. So if they um, come across a large stand of pine trees with abundant cones, no matter what time of year, they will settle in and might even start nesting. And so these 10 different types, some of them are specific to geographic areas, but others are no, more nomadic. And the prediction this year is in addition to our regular type that we have here, there are at least three more types of red crossbill that are starting to move east and we might see in Vermont and might even have enough food here because we have a bumper pine crop this year. They might have enough food to nest in Vermont. So um, you can record um, these using the Merlin uh, Bird ID app by Cornell University. Uh, you can record the sound of a red crossbill and submit it to eBird and that can be used to identify which type it is and also track where the movements are happening of these different red crossbill types. Um, both the red crossbill and the white winged crossbill um, are often seen in conifers but will sometimes be seen down along a road and they'll do this behavior called gridding. Um, because pine seeds are so resinous and hard to digest, they'll actually consume little bits of gravel from the road and that gravel as it passes through their digestive system will help sort of to grind up um, and digest those super tough pine seeds. So you, you'll, you can see groups of crossbills down along dirt roads sometimes in the winter time. Two more finches that are also here in the summer but um, will occur in much larger groups in the winter are the purple finch and the pine siskin. So um, in eruptive years, we can get huge flocks of these, um, of northern birds moving southward. Uh, and this year already, there's been a pretty significant flight of pine siskins moving south. I was hearing them as early as October and November, um, you know, in places that I wouldn't expect to hear siskins. Um, and it looks like they're continuing to move south even into December. And here is a really exciting one um, that is an exclusively a winter finch, and it's um, the red pole. Uh, red poles are breeding further north. They're, they exist in North America and Eurasia, and they're moving south when uh, seed crops further north fail. It looks like, unfortunately, this year might not be a really good red pole year because there's an abundant food crop up north, but we still might get some red poles. And the treat when looking at um, big flocks of red poles is to try and pick out different kinds of red pole. And in the past, we've referred to um, a couple different species. So the common red pole is sort of the default. There's also a hoary red pole and a lesser red pole. But some recent research shows that these are probably just different variations of the same species. So what was thought as I as you know different um, different species that were closely related, it's now uh, research is now showing that there's likely just one gene or one set of genes that controls the the plumage of or the the phenotype of these birds throughout their range. So um, it's likely that in the future, um, they will be treated as one individual species that has a couple different morphs or types rather than um, individual and distinct species. So I wanna move on from talking about the birds to talking about how to go birding in the winter. And this will be fairly brief because um, I know I'm at the end of my time. But I want to really stress safety first. 
Um, it's critically important in the winter because conditions can vary um, and be really hazardous. So it's important when you're going out birding in the winter to make sure you have a route planned that you know where you're going and you know that the route is safe and that there's safe access to your site. Um, I've had times where I've wanted to go somewhere and you get there and maybe the trail is covered with ice and or maybe the road hasn't even been plowed and um, you know, no bird is worth getting injured. Um, wear plenty of layers. So uh, make sure you've got the right boots, lots of lots of uh, lots of layered clothing that you can take off in the car when it's hot and put on when you're going to be hiking. I really stress having good traction gear. So in addition to boots, having things like yak tracks or micro spikes and even poles to wear. Um, make sure you have water and snacks and don't forget your binoculars. Um, too many times I've forgotten my binoculars at home. Um, and these are all good tips I recommend as we start to think about the winter bird count season. So as people are participating in winter bird counts, um, it's a real big endeavor. You might be out counting birds for eight hours straight. Um, so it's really important to prepare in advance so that you have a successful bird count day. Where to go birding in the winter in Vermont. Um, you know, we're I'm giving this talk to the Green Mountain Audubon Society. So we're focused on the counties along the lake. Um, but even there, there's a pretty amazing diversity of habitat. So if you're looking to see things like scoters and grebes um, and maybe even uh, raptors like eagles, um, going out to the lake, finding spots where the water is still open, um, and even sometimes the larger rivers like the Lamoille, the Missisquoi might have open water, um, and those are great places to look for water birds. Um, some other places to check are agricultural areas. So I love driving through um, the open farm fields and looking around farmyards in places like um, Franklin County or Addison County. And there you can find those groups of larks and buntings. You can also spot raptors that are hanging out, hunting in fields um, and even stalking through farmyards looking for other birds. And then um, the good places to look for those eruptive finches are really the forested foothills, um, areas where those sort of mast, those seed trees exist in numbers, looking for big stands of conifers, but also looking for places where um, people have planted ornamental trees. Um, those are really good places to look for winter finches. And then those, those stragglers, um, and stalwarts may exist pretty much anywhere on this map. So we've had pretty amazing winter birds show up in um, the most unlikely of places. And it really just takes a lot of scouting and scouring through good habitat, even in suboptimal conditions to find those really exciting um, winter surprises. And so I wanna talk just briefly at the end because I know I'm gonna get questions about these. Um, bird feeders are a, a really phenomenal way to enjoy birds in the winter time when there might not be um, as much excitement to get outside. Um, they sort of bring the birds to you and it can be really great for the birds too. We talked about chickadees being able to create that amazing mental map of food resources and it might add your bird feeder to that map. Um, so it might keep coming back all winter long. So it's really important to both keep your bird feeders clean and to keep them filled. If the chickadee is coming back to your bird feeder um, thinking it's gonna be filled and it turns out you've gone on vacation and forgotten to fill it, um, it's maybe just wasted a bunch of energy to, to track down a food source that is no longer available. And it's also important to keep them clean, clean them year to year, but also um, clean them uh, occasionally when both, you know, in between filling them. Uh, and there are germs, there are diseases that can be transmitted between birds that are gathered at bird feeders and can even be caused by contact at bird feeders. So just cleaning them with a simple bleach solution 
uh, letting them dry before you uh, hang them out for the season. And every once in a while when you're you're getting ready to fill them again. And then if you see any signs of bird disease, so sometimes you might see um, birds that have growths on their feet, birds that are not acting right, um, birds that have um, swelling on the face, uh, those would be all reasons to maybe take your bird feeders down for a little while, let them disperse, find other sources, clean them before you put them back up. And then of course, being bird aware is or being bear aware is really important. So um, there is some guidance from uh, other organizations that will say like, you know, don't put your feeders up until November or December and take them down, you know, by April 1st. I really don't think those hard dates are helpful, particularly when, when the climate is changing so fast that bears might be active any time of year. I think it's important to be aware of where you are on the landscape and where bears are. Um, if you live in an area that has a lot of bear activity, you have seen bears in your yard before, um, and maybe it's a really mild winter, um, it might not ever be a truly safe place for you to put um, uh, feeders up, or it might be safer for you to put them up during the day um, right alongside the residents and then take them in at night um, and watch them to make sure there aren't signs of bear activity. But there might be other places like, say, downtown St. Albans or downtown Burlington, um, where there's uh, very limited uh, or uh, bear activity. The risk is low, um, and in a in a cold year, um, you might be able to put the, your bird feeders up relatively early. So I think it's a, a judgment that people have to make for themselves. And really, the golden rule is: if you see a bear, if you see bear activity, if they come to your bird feeders, you need to take them down and leave them down, because the risk of a bear returning to your feeders could be the end of its life. Um, bears that grow accustomed to people uh, can be really dangerous. And Vermont Fish and Wildlife will euthanize bears that have become accustomed to people. So it's really about keeping um, both your bird feeders safe, but more importantly, keeping the bears safe. And with that, I wanna talk just briefly about some community science opportunities. As I mentioned a few times, uh, the Christmas bird count, which I call the winter bird count, um, is coming up. Uh, it starts a week from today and goes for several weeks. Um, the, the bird count is uh, circled around these, these different count circles. So all over the Americas, there are count circles that each are run by a different person that um, chooses a different date within that count period. And it's a 24 hour count. It starts at midnight and it goes to the next midnight. And the goal is to count every single bird in that circle. And so you can see, we've got a lot of different circles in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> I coordinate the Hunger Mountain uh, bird count, which is in the Waterbury area. And this year, our count is gonna be on December 29th. So if you are looking to count birds, um, we have plenty of opportunities for you to join. Um, of all skill levels. Um, and then if you're looking to join a different count, maybe there's one closer to you, you can go on the Audubon website and you can see the interactive map, click on it and even get contact information um, for the person who's running that local count. Uh, but now's the time to sign up because we're, we're fast approaching the count period. If you're looking to do something that's a little bit more um, at home, the Great Backyard Bird Count and Project Feeder Watch um, are happening. So Project Feeder Watch is an ongoing bird count that happens every winter, goes from November through April. You can sign up on their website and that's um, keeping track of your birds week to week. So you're gonna report what birds you're seeing every week um, versus the Great Bur Backyard Bird Count happens in February and that's a little bit more intensive where it's wanting you to keep track of birds at your bird feeder um, throughout the course of that um, period. And then another fun um, opportunity is the Midwinter Bald Eagle Survey that happens in January in Vermont. It's coordinated by Audubon Vermont 
Um, and I'm sure they'll put out more information as the time approaches, um, but they get teams together to go out and look for and count um, bald eagles in the Champlain Valley. And then uh, some ongoing research that you can participate in um, is happens through the Finch Research Network. So I mentioned the evening grosbeaks that have declined significantly. Um, Finch Research Network uses data submitted by eBird users uh, to track the population of evening grosbeaks. So if you haven't already, uh, you can go to eBird.org, either online or download the mobile app um, to submit reports of any bird you see anytime, anywhere. And all of those data are used by researchers. Um, and with that, I'll just say that winter birding is a lot of fun. Um, even uh, though the conditions might not be as lovely as the summertime, there are some amazing things to see and experience. And I encourage everyone to get out there and try it. Zach, are you ready for some questions? Can you hear me? And I see... Tom um, has uh, some questions from folks to sort of field. Exactly. Can you hear me? Uh, has a plug here that the uh, Burlington Winter Bird Count is happening Sunday, December 17th. Um, and I'm sure he's got more information about that. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Zach, can you hear me? Oh, Tom, I, I can't hear you. Okay. Um, well, we have a few questions, but apparently you're not able to hear me or hear Jeff. So, Tom, we could, we could send the um, questions to Zach in the chat. Uh huh. Can you hear him, Jeff? I can hear Zach fine. He can't hear either of us. Uh, it looks. Yeah, you know, I have no idea. There we go. Can you hear us now, Zach? No, no, hear me. We yes, are. Yes, I can oh. hear you now. Great. Take it away. Oh, good. Well, for the folks that are patient and sticking around, we've had a couple of questions. Um, I broke in earlier, but I didn't think you can hear me. So here we go. When you put up that really nice slide that you had done of all the winter birds that might somebody might be running into, whether at their bird feeder, uh, one of the questions was, how can we get our hands on this image? Uh, and we actually had this second question about how can we get this hands on the image? And I thought I would answer and then you can chime in. Um, once this recording will go up on our YouTube channel, give us about a day or two to edit it, then you can go to Green Mountain Audubon's website and you can click on events. And as you scroll down, there'll be a link to all of our past uh, Zoom programs, including this one. And when you go through the program, you can simply uh, you know, use some sort of uh, tool that you're used to using. I'm a Mac person, so you go into preview and you select the, the screen and you can turn it into a JPEG and then you can do what you want with it. So Zach, what, how would you answer? How could they get their hands on uh, some of the slides, particularly the one of the different winter birds? Um, I can send that to someone to, to post to. I. Um, I sort of created it from different images that I found online, you know, different images from like the Audubon website um, and just have it as an informal resource for um, people at the feeder watch. Um, so I'd be glad to, glad to share that. Um, sure. Would you be willing to, uh, I think it would be a great idea to put that in our newsletter and then people could get that and they could uh, see it that way. So we have a whole lot of people who are streaming out. So if you'll permit me, Zach, I'd like to ask the 55 people left, if you'd be so kind, uh, we would like you to uh, consider donating a small two, three, $5 fee. Um, and Jeff has already posted in the chat 
because we're going to be using this for a lot of our educational opportunity for underprivileged youth. Uh, we just found out a great opportunity up in the Franklin County uh, where the Friends of Missisquoi are spending some money, um, about $100 at a time, to have some of the local school children be able to come onto the reserve. And we and our board would like to support that. So if you'd be so kind as to check out our website and up on the upper right hand, you can see that there's a membership and donation. And whether you join us as a member, um, it, it would be really great if you could um, support us in any way that is possible for you. Jeff, would you like to say anything in closing before I thank Jack, Zach? No, so I so there's uh, two notes in the chat about uh, upcoming winter bird counts, one in Burlington and one in the Mad River Valley. So take note of that. There's email addresses if you're interested in volunteering. And we are going to let you turn your cameras on if I can figure out how to do this. Uh, there we go, start video. Um, so we we turned off capabilities because we got Zoom bombed a while back, but if you wanna unmute yourself and say thank you to Zach, I think you should have the capability to do that now and make this feel a little more interactive. And, and thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks, thanks, Zach, for uh, for a great presentation. And Tom, whatever you wanted to add, feel free. Zach, I really want to applaud you. Uh, you have an amazing ability to have all these facts in your head because I know that there was no script you were reading from. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for it. Was a very comprehensive. It was very educational. I think all of us learned a ton. And now you can see people are going to start waving. Everybody wave at Zach. Okay, people. Now you can see your crowd here. And I'm yeah. happy to stick around and answer questions too. I know that um, there are folks that um, have burning winter burning questions. <laughs> yes, we can do that. So uh, I tell you what we'd like to do. Just put up your hand like I'm doing and uh, we can recognize you and you can uh, ask Zach a question and we'll see if it works. Who would like to ask Zach a question? And, and oh, Pat, I see your hand is up. Anyone in particular? Uh, they just want to look at you, Zach. <laughs> well, our, our group is a bit shy, I'd say. Uh, well, it's a super knowledgeable. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a nice thank you from Rich Kelly uh, for plugging the Friends of Missisquoi. That's always good. Any questions? Well, we're down to 32 people. So Zach, I think you just overwhelmed everybody by your amazing knowledge. I, and people are is, still processing. That is the, uh, that's the mark of a good presenter. Uh, I learned a lot. Oh, I have somebody, uh, Carolyn Bates has her hand up, but I, we can't hear you, Carolyn. You have to unmute yourself. It um it wouldn't let me unmute earlier. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, let me. I did it already, Carolyn. You can now, so. I was just gonna put some lights on here. I turned the other one off so people could see. There. Oops. We can hear you, Carolyn. So you can ask your question now. Okay, I wanted to know if um if um Zach is gonna give any tours. You know, it's it's funny that the last picture I showed where it said winter birding is from, I think that was the first time I led, it was either a, a winter bird tour or an owl, a winter owl. It was owl. an owling tour, Zach. It was winter owl. owling. It started at Dead Creek. Yeah, and I thought maybe a dozen people would show up, and I think we had 40-something people, and it was... <laughs> It was wild to try and bring all of those people along on an owling um, uh, exhibition. But I led that trip for quite a few years in a row, and we had some pretty amazing uh, success um, finding over the years. We found uh, short-eared owls and saw-wet owl and screech owl and uh, great horned owl. Um, 
And I would love to do some of those again, but I don't have any planned right now. Um, I, I used to work full time as a teacher naturalist at North Branch and now um, I work as a nurse. So I spend most of my time stuck in the hospital and not outside, but I will see I will see if I can get something arranged. I used to also um, run a, a winter birding trip in February, which I think is um, a time when people are least likely to get outside, but it's probably some of the best winter birding. So I might be able to put something together for February. Well, we would love to host you, Zach. And Pat Phillips is the person who's in charge of our outings. Uh, so perhaps we can work something out. That'd be great. Is there another question for Zach? Oh, well, you know, I asked two of them where they was he going to do any classes? <laughs> or, but he didn't answer the classes. No, I don't have a plan to do any classes. I like doing this kind of thing because I can talk about all different things. Um, and so my my plan is to talk all about in April, I get to talk about rare birds. So which means I get to spend a month researching all the rare birds of Vermont um, ahead of time. There are some great organizations that do offer classes. Um, North Branch Nature Center, where I used to work, they do some phenomenal classes and workshops on um, birding in particular, some geared toward beginner birders. So that would be a great place to start. And Carolyn, you can check our website, but our next presentation is January 4th, and that is gonna be Mav Kim and Bernie Paquette, and the title is Great Finds in Nature. And then uh, a Northern girl, uh, Emily Filiberti, whose mother we all know, and we all know Emily, she is involved in, at a graduate level in doing golden wing warbler research, and that's going to be January 18th. So we do have seven more programs scheduled, and a few others are in the works. So we would love to have you pop over to greenmountainaudubon.org and be able to look at our programs and hopefully join us again. We're down to 24 diehards. Are there any other questions? Well, Zach, I think that makes it a wrap. Thank you again very much. I thank Jeff and Pat for getting us all straightened with Zoom. And uh, Zach, we wish you happy birding. We wish you happy nursing. We wish you happy new year. Thank you all. And I will see you um, on April 18th, if not before then. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks, thanks for attending, everybody. Nice to see you all.